Get those hands together, everyone. There you go. Risen, he's risen. Great were in the 
joyful day. The love of God come to the Western world and also come to the Eastern world. Today, I have two bad people come from China to be baptized in the name of the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now may I introduce you all my sister, Sister Mandy Klein from China. She probably confessed Christ Jesus is her personal Savior. Mandy 姐妹，今天你愿意接受耶稣基督为你个人的救主吗？是的。你既然愿意接受基督为你个人救主，我要奉耶稣基督的名替你施洗。In obedience to the command of the Lord Christ Jesus, and also upon your public confession that Christ Jesus is your personal Savior, I want to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 我现在奉圣父、圣子、圣灵的名替你施洗。The next one I want to baptize is、uh, Dr. Wong, a physicist. He is doing the research in the physics department at Utah. 下一个我是替王博士来试镜，他是个物理学家，在 Utah 德州大学里面物理系做研究的工作。王永东，你愿意接受耶稣基督的吩咐？奉圣父、圣子的名，受洗归入耶稣的名下吗？我愿意。Amen. As you say, you want to accept Christ Jesus. I want to baptize you in obedience to the command of our Lord Christ Jesus, and also upon your public profession that Christ is your personal Savior. I want to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God bless you, brothers. It's for us an honor also to baptize five brothers and sisters in the faith from Berino, New Mexico. And in name of Vida Nueva Betel, we thank God for the opportunity that He has given us to, today to baptize our brothers. Now, also, we want to thank you to be the witnesses of this. And I'm going to ask Sister Carla Chavira, please, to come here. Now I'm going to do it also in Spanish. So we'll have three languages here today. Okay. I'm going to ask him two questions. The first one is: Have you accepted Jesus voluntarily, voluntary as your Lord, Savior, and God? And the second question is: Have you decided to be baptized today,、uh, voluntary? Usted hermana ha recibido a Jesucristo como su Señor, Salvador y Dios. Voluntariamente ha decidido bautizarse esta mañana. Bueno, en el nosotros、eh, siguiendo la obediencia de nuestro Señor Jesucristo y su mandamiento la bautizamos en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. And also, we're going to baptize two couples. And I'm going to ask him to pass right here, Sister Lorena Sainz, and Brother Sainz Polanco and Alex Polanco. Please, pasen por favor. En esta mañana, yo quiero hacerles las preguntas siguientes. La primera es: ¿Ustedes voluntariamente han entregado su vida a Jesucristo como su Salvador, su Señor y su Dios? Ustedes voluntariamente han decidido seguir el ejemplo de nuestro Señor Jesucristo y obedecer su mandamiento de bautizarse. Sí. Sí. Bueno, voy a bautizar a nuestra hermana en el nombre del Padre 
y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo de este lado, hermana, por favor. Okay. Y del Espíritu Santo la voy a bautizar. Hermano, póngase aquí, por favor, para. Felicidades. Póngase. Póngase de este lado, hermano, para que le tomen las fotografías. Yo lo bautizo en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Yo soy un líder. Pasa. Pasa. The next couple, they're our sister, Laura Iracheta, and our brother, Jose Iracheta. Please come forward. Pásenle, por favor. Les voy a hacer las siguientes preguntas. Ustedes voluntariamente han entregado su vida a Jesucristo como su Señor, Salvador y Dios. Ustedes voluntariamente han decidido seguir el ejemplo de nuestro Señor Jesucristo y su mandamiento de ser bautizados. Sí. Bueno, hermano, por favor, yo le bautizo en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Sí. José, yo te bautizo en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Thank you very much for this. And also, we thank God for the opportunity that he has given us today. May God bless you. And please, pray for us as we will pray for you. God bless you. Thank you.
life all comes down to what we believe. Easter, the Easter story, was intended to be your story. God, who is the master of all storytellers, actually envisioned the events of Easter long before you were ever conceived or dreamed about. God knew in the beginning of time that he had a plan for his creation. He knew that we would sin and that we would fall short of his glory, and he knew that we would need a Savior. And so from the beginning of time, he was planning, foreshadowing Easter. Have you ever wondered why in the creation story that when Moses recorded when God created the heavens and the earth, that when he recorded those seven days of creation, that it always read like this, evening and morning, evening and morning. As you know, our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrate the new day at the beginning of the evening. So why did the creator God describe creation as evening and than morning. I want to suggest to you that every single day is a reminder of Easter. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, the cross, evening, and then morning. Darkness and light. The cross and the resurrection. That from the beginning of time, God was just trying to hint through his creation that the darkness would never, ever have the final word. You may be aware that last night when the sun went down, that according to the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., that our city, our valley was dark for 11 hours and 39 minutes. For 11 hours, it has seemed as if darkness which blot out the sun and that darkness would rule and reign over the creation of God. But if you happen to be at the sunrise service this morning, you saw, as we see every morning if we're up early, how the darkness never has the final word. You see, the, the sun always drives back to darkness, and the Son of God always drives back the darkness. Evening, then morning, the cross, and the resurrection. You see, in the Old Testament, that was foreshadowing. He was telling us of something that would happen one day. For those of us today, it is a reminder. Every night when the sun goes down, it reminds us that Jesus died and he died on the cross. But every morning when it breaks the horizon, that he rose from the dead. You see, we don't celebrate Easter just on Easter. We don't celebrate Easter just on Sunday. Every morning when the sun breaks the horizon, God is reminding us that his son is alive. We see the story of Jesus is your story. In Romans chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Paul has been teaching us about how much God loves us. He taught us about this incredible free gift of salvation. But some people began to think, well, if salvation is free and God loves me, loves me in spite of my sin, then maybe I can just keep on doing what I've always been doing. So he poses the question in verse 1 of Romans chapter 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, should I keep on sinning so God can keep chasing after me and keep forgiving me and keep loving me? N.T. Wright, who's a British theologian and scholar, was commenting on this particular scripture and he had a rather ingenious and creative way of dealing with what Paul was saying. He's, he reminded us of the story of the prodigal son. Most of you remember that story. It's probably Jesus' classic story in Luke chapter 15. If you remember the story, there was, there was a father, and he had two boys, an older son who was very, very responsible. Those of us who are older children, I'm the oldest in my family, we know about being responsible. You know, we know about following the rules, the meeting expectations. And then there was a younger son, you know, the baby of the family. And those of us who are older, we know about the baby of the family, right? Well, the baby of the family, when he came of age, he was sick and tired of all the rules and all the regulations and all the things about living at home. And so he went to his dad, and he said to his dad, Dad, I want you to give me my inheritance now. Not when you die. I want you to give me my inheritance now. Now, for those of us that are parents, that's unthinkable, isn't it? What child would ever come to their parent and ask for their inheritance 
and ask for it now. In essence, what the younger son was saying to his dad, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead. I don't really want to have anything to do with you. All I want from you is what you can give me. And strangely, in the story, Jesus said the father did the unthinkable. He gave his son the inheritance. Well, you know the story. The son takes off. He has money in his pocket. He heads to the big city. He heads where everything's exciting. And, you know, as long as you have money in your pocket, you got friends, right? You have things you can do. You can live life to the fullest. And so he had a pocket full of money and a lot of friends. But life isn't always like that, as you know. And Jesus said eventually there was a famine that hit the land, an economic downturn, a depression. And suddenly that big pocket full of money quickly disappeared. With the lack of money, his friends disappeared. The fun disappeared. He had to go get a job. He couldn't find work. I mean, it was a bad depression. And so the only job he could find was working for a farmer. He grew up on a farm. And so he went and hired out as a hired man on a farm. And this farmer gave him a job that no Jewish boy would ever want to have. You see, the Jews have rules about things. They have things that are kosher and clean and things that are unclean. Well, pigs and hogs are unclean. And guess what job the young man received? It was the job of taking care of the pigs. And things were so bad that he actually was so hungry that he wanted to eat what the pigs were eating. My grandson George was visiting me a few days ago. We have a little dog, a little puppy in our house, and we have her bowl sitting out. And wouldn't you know it, little George decided that he was going to eat some of our dog food, okay? Well, you know, he's a little boy and experiencing life, but he only ate one piece. It didn't taste like chocolate. It didn't taste like candy. It didn't taste like Cheerios. He put it in and looked at us funny. That young man didn't want to eat what the pigs were eating, but he was starving. He began to think about home. Isn't it funny when we leave home and we start living life on our own that our homes aren't like we remembered them? He realized that his dad was a much better man than he ever thought. He thought about the servants that worked for his dad and how his father took care of them and how they had all their needs met and they ate better than he ate. And he thought to himself, you know, I'm going to go home. In fact, Jesus said that he came to his senses. It'd be another way of saying he repented. He came to his senses and he said, I'm going to go home. But he knew that he'd already blown it, and so he came and rehearsed the speech, and this is what the speech said. He said, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you, Dad. I am not worthy to be your son anymore. I wanted you to die. Would you please just let me work for you? He didn't want to sleep in the house. He wanted to sleep out in the bunkhouse. He didn't want to sit at the table with his dad. He didn't think that would ever happen again. He wanted just to work for his dad. So he climbed out of the pig pen and started heading home. If you've ever really messed up and you're about to face your parents or your grandparents, you know you, how you rehearse trying to cover up and explain what you did. And he kept thinking, what am I going to say? How am I going to say it? Just as he crested the horizon and he could see his home in the distance, there was a figure on the porch, and that figure started moving toward him. In fact, this figure started running at him. At first, he didn't recognize who it was. He thought maybe it was a servant checking out who is this, this bum, this beggar that showed up out of the middle of nowhere. But the closer the figure got to him, he realized it was his dad. And his dad was running at him. Well, those of us who've ever messed up, can you imagine your dad running at you? And you're thinking to yourself, my dad's going to kill me. I mean, if I, I need to run for my life. My dad is running at me. But the closer his father got, he could tell it wasn't anger that flashed from his eyes. It was love. In fact, his dad's arms were wide open as he reached him, and he threw his arms around his son and just hugged him tight. And his boy pushed him away and said, Dad, Dad, wait a minute. You need to hear this. I sinned against heaven, and I sinned against you. And just as he was about to say, I'm no longer worthy to be your son, his dad interrupted him. 
He didn't want to hear the rest of the speech. He started yelling for servants. He said, bring my boy some new clothes, a, a robe. Bring my son some shoes to put on his feet. Go get a ring and put it on his finger. You see, in the Jewish family, a ring was the symbol of the authority of the dad. It was like giving your son a credit card. He said, put a ring on my son's finger. Go kill the fatty calf. We're going to have a party and a barbecue tonight because my son was dead and he's alive again. And there the boy was wrapped in the embrace of his father. He was loved and forgiven. At this point, N.T. Wright says, imagine for a moment this same boy about three years later. He's gotten into the routine of living at the house and working on the farm. He's gotten back into the routine of the rules and all of the things that go with family life. And one day he thinks to himself, you know, I'm getting tired of being around the house. He thinks about the life he lived there in the big city. He thinks about having a pocket full of money. He thinks about doing as he pleased and not having to worry about what anybody else thought. And he thinks to himself, you know, I'm going to go to my dad. It worked the first time. I'm going to go to my dad and ask him for some more money and see if my dad just happens would be willing to give me the money. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go off to that foreign city and I'm going to blow all of that money. And when things are really bad, I'm going to come home and I'm going to do it all over again. And I'm going to tell him how sorry I am. And we'll just do it all over again. N.T. Wright said, that is absolutely unimaginable. How in the world could that son ever, ever want to leave a father that loved him like that? That's why Paul said in Romans 6, 1, he says, what shall, then we, shall we say? Are we to continue to sin? Are we to continue to run away from home? Are we continue to live as we please so that our father's grace may keep chasing after us and keep chasing after us? He said, absolutely not in verse 2. He says, by no means. And then he poses a couple of questions that we should have known the answer to. The first question, how can we, those of us who are followers of Christ, how can we, those of us who came running home when we realized we needed a Savior, how can we who died to sin live in it? Paul said, when you run home, when you realize that your choice has put you in a mess, it changes you. You don't want to live like that anymore. You don't want to be that person anymore. He says that what happened is that we literally died to sin. Notice verse 2. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, remember the mental images of a few moments ago? those young men and women being baptized, he said, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You're attending the first Baptist church. Baptists like to baptize, okay? The word baptize in the English language is actually a trans, an English a transliteration or a making a Greek word into an English word. The Greek word baptizo, that we now use baptize, that word literally means to immerse in water or plunge something under a fluid or liquid. Back in the days of the King James Version of the Bible, the Church of England, when they baptized somebody, they sprinkled them, oftentimes as babies. They would take what they would call holy water, and they would take a child, and the child would be held in the priest's hands, and he would sprinkle water, and that was baptism. And so when the guys were translating the King James Version of the Bible, if they would have translated it literally, it would have said, Jesus would have said, there, go, go, go make disciples of all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, you see, the Church of England wasn't immersing anybody, and so they didn't want their heads cut off because that's what happened when the king didn't like what you did. And so they just changed the word. They just stuck the Greek word in the English text and used the word baptize. 
The word baptized means to be immersed. You notice that every single person that was baptized a moment ago, they were soaking wet from head to toe when it was all over. You can't be half baptized. You can't be part baptized. To be baptized means you're just, you hold them under till they bubble, right? That's what, that's what you do when you baptize somebody. Now, notice Paul is not saying that we got wet. When he's talking about the transformation of your spiritual life, he's not talking about getting wet. Although that's an incredible step in your journey of faith, that's not what he's talking about. He says that we were what baptized into Christ Jesus. Just as our friends were lowered into the water and that water engulfed and surrounded them. Paul says that when you came running home, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you were immersed, you were baptized, you were surrounded and engulfed in the very presence of Jesus himself. That we were baptized into Jesus. And when we were baptized into Jesus, we were baptized into his death. Remember, evening and morning, cross, resurrection. We were baptized into the death of Christ. To explain it, notice in verse 4, he says, We were buried, we have a tomb here, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What Paul is saying is that that Easter story is actually your story, that just as Jesus died on the cross, spiritually speaking, when you trusted Christ, you died. Something inside of you died. And when that part of you died, you were buried, but you didn't stay dead because what happened, God raised you just like he raised Jesus, but now you're not who you used to be. You walk different than you used to walk. You walk in what he calls newness of life. Newness. Something's changed about you. Well, what does that mean? Well, he goes on to try to explain it in the next section in verse 5. He says, for if we've been united with him in death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in, his, in a resurrection like his. Notice in verse 6, we know, this is something we ought to know. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing or to be powerless so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Has there ever been a time in your life that you felt as if you couldn't control yourself? There was some habit, some compulsive activity, some attitude that just sort of grabbed you, and it was as if you were the slave of whatever that was, and you just did what it told you to do. You'll notice that in the scriptures, he didn't use the word sins. He used the word sin because he's not talking about all the stuff we do. He's talking about the root of the problem, which is inside of you, the sin principle. You see, deep inside of us, there's something fundamentally wrong. It goes back to great, great, great granddaddy Adam that he passed on to us a sinful nature, a tendency to rebel against God. Those of us with children, you never had to teach your children to disobey. You never had to teach your children how not to do the right thing. Your children instinctively knew how to do it because they're your children. They learned it from us, right? He said that when Jesus died on the cross, something incredible happened in that moment. Those of us who have trusted Christ by faith, he says in verse 6, we know that our old self, literally our old man or woman, if you would like to put it that way, our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be brought to nothing or might become powerless. So what in the world is he talking about? Well, what he's saying is this. You really can change and you really can be different because of the cross. That when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, that part of you, that old self that rebels against God, that part of you was crucified with Jesus. So that your body of sin, you say, well, pastor, does that mean that my physical body is evil? No, your body's not evil. 
the Greeks believed the body was evil and the spirit was good and the body was evil and the soul was good. That's not what the scripture teaches. Your body's not evil. God created your body. But what has happened is your body has become, it's like sin has a home field advantage using that terminology with your body. Last week, the uh, El Paso UTEP miners, the lady miners, won another game in the NIT championships. One of the reasons that they won is not only because of their skills, but they have an incredible home field advantage. There's not a team in the United States that would like to play the miners in El Paso. This week, Oregon on Monday night is going to find out what it's like to play not only the five minor girls on the floor, but seven or eight or 10,000 crazy minor fans in the stands. Because when you walk them to Don Haskins' floor, you're not just playing those five girls, you're playing all of us. That's a home field advantage. Well, you see, your, your old man, your sinful nature has had a home field advantage with your body for a long, long time. Paul said in Corinthians, he said, when we sin sexually, we actually sin against our own body. What happens is when we live, when sin tells us how to live our lives, we develop some really bad habits and really bad attitudes, and they begin to shape how we think, how we feel, how our body responds. And Paul says that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, just like Jesus brought the dead, just like God brought the dead body of Jesus out of the grave, God can change your body. And no longer does your body become your enemy, but your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit, and God begins to give you a home field advantage for doing the right thing, not the wrong thing. That your flesh no longer fights you like it used to fight you. That at the cross, your old self was crucified. Now, to make it even more vivid, notice what he says in verse 7. He says, for one who has died has been set free from sin. If someone dies, if they physically die, those things that we do that we're so embarrassed of, you don't have to worry about it any longer. Back in the, I think it was the first week of November, one of my good friends, a doctor, Fred, I was telling him about some of the struggles I was having physically, and he said, David, you need to go to the hospital, and you need to go right now. I said, I can't go right now. He said, I'm serious. You need to go right now. I said, I got all these things to do. He said, David, if I was an air traffic controller and you were a pilot, I would tell you to land your plane right now. Well, you know what I did. I didn't land my plane. I did all the things I was supposed to do, but I did go to the hospital eventually. Well, when I get to the hospital, they begin to run some tests. They took me into a CT scan to check my lungs. And I'm lying there doing everything. As they told me, they shoot the dye in my vein, and all of a sudden, I feel all warm inside. If you've ever had that test, you know what I'm talking about. And suddenly, I'm lying there, and I'm just lying there and lying there, and I thought, what in the world's going on? Well, in the control room, the technician who was in charge of the CT scan had just told my wife that she could watch the screen, but he couldn't tell her what was going on. He said, if you happen to see a little bitty black dot on the screen, that possibly could be a blood clot in your husband's lungs. And if he has a blood clot, then he'll probably have to stay in the hospital. So Robin's standing there watching the test. He says, I'm going to shoot the dye in, and he shoots it in, and immediately at the bottom of both of my lungs, not just one little dot appears, but many, many little dots. In fact, there are a whole bunch of them. In fact, the technician sort of blew his cover, and he gasped. And he said, oh, my God, that's what he said, I can't believe he's alive. Now, obviously, that scared my wife half to death, you know, because here's the thing. She said, well, can we even get him off the table? In fact, they left me in there longer than I was supposed to be because they forgot about me because they were so stunned that I wasn't dead, but I was alive. I'd actually walked in. I actually drove to the hospital. And it's like, what in the world's going on? Well, anyway, they tell me I'm spending the night. I've never, I've visited a lot of hospitals. I'm a professional hospital visitor, okay? I've been in a lot of hospitals. I've never had to spend the night as a patient. I'd much rather visit, I'll be honest. I'd been told as a pastor that whenever someone spends the night in the hospital, they think about dying. They think about their mortality. If you've ever had that happen, you know what I'm talking about. Wouldn't you know it, my first night in the hospital, I thought about dying. 
I made a mistake. I need to let doctors be doctors is one of the things I've learned because I pulled out my iPhone and I Googled pulmonary embolisms. That's what I had. I Googled it. And, and there were several sites, and I went to the Mayo site, and the Mayo site basically informed me that people who have pulmonary embolisms, 30% of the time they die immediately. 30% of the time they die immediately. I thought, I didn't even feel that bad. They said, and as I kept reading, it said, you'll start having these sensations and you could die within an hour. I'm in the hospital. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, what in the world is going on? And suddenly I started thinking about what if I died? Imagine if I would have died that night. I've confessed to you that when I go to the grocery store and I'm going down the aisle where little Debbie is, you know little Debbie, you know those little Swiss cakes? Or, you know, when I'm going down the aisle and she's calling for me to buy a box or two boxes or when I'm in the kitchen and, and you know, she suggests that I shouldn't, I shouldn't stop with just one, I ought to have six, you know, that. If I was dead, I would never, ever have any trouble with little Debbie again, right? I wouldn't crave little Debbie if I was dead. And on top of that, you, you know that those of us who get up and have a quiet time and exercise in the morning, you know that feeling when you just want to roll over in bed? Say, well, I did it yesterday. I'm just going to sleep 15 minutes longer. If I was dead, I couldn't roll over in bed, but I wouldn't have to worry about running either, would I? If I was dead. I'm a red-blooded man. I see a beautiful woman. My dad's always told me it's not the first look, son, that'll get you, it's the second look. You see, if I was dead, I wouldn't have to worry about where my eyes looked and what my heart thought or what my mind thought. You see, if, if I'm physically dead, I'm not tempted to overeat, I'm not tempted to not exercise, I'm not tempted to do things I shouldn't do because I'm dead. Well, here's the good news. You can be dead and you don't have to die. You can be spiritually dead, but you don't have to die. The, the, those things inside of you that have captured you and enslaved you, Jesus can set you free from that. You can be dead without dying. You say, well, how in the world can that happen? Well, listen to what he says in verse 8. He says, now if we have died with Christ. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, I died on the cross. That dark part of me died with him. If we believe... He says, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. That power within us that wants to destroy us. Jesus died so that that power would be defanged. He died so that it would be crushed and ended. He said he died to sin once and for all. That the life he lives, he lives to God. So, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That word considered is a Greek word that would be used by bankers and accountants. This past Wednesday, we had a speaker called Frank Turek, and he, his speech was, I do not have enough faith to be an atheist, okay? And if you were here, he did an incredible job of describing the majesty of creation and how you would have to literally be crazy to believe that this was an accident. You'd have to have incredible faith to think that God didn't create all things. Well, I don't have enough faith to do online banking, Okay, have, how many of you have done online banking? You know what I'm talking about? I've been here for six years as your pastor, and I have never one time ever held a paycheck in my hand. Not one time. You say, well, pastor, are we paying you? Well, I, yeah, you're paying me. But they, they did direct deposit. And so Rick and Leslie make a direct deposit into my checking account. Leslie sends me an email that tells me to ha it happened, and then I go get my iPhone just to make sure that the number's changed, okay? Now, I've actually never, ever seen the money go into my account, but I can promise you Robin spends it as if it's there, okay? <laughs> I've never seen it happen. I've seen the numbers change, but I've never literally seen dollars go into my account and dollars go out of my account. But I live by faith 
that it's true. Paul said you need to consider, you need to calculate, you need to count yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Dead to sin. Now, I had a brilliant idea for a sermon illustration. I was going to actually, last week I gave away money. This week I was going to write on money, okay? Now, I've discovered by doing some research, if I write on this, this $20 bill, I might need a lawyer, okay? So I'm not actually going to write, okay? But let's imagine that I wrote on this $20 bill, I am dead to sin, If I had written that, those words are every bit as true and real as this $20 bill. I am, according to Paul, because I'm a Christ follower, because I'm a child of God, I am dead to sin, just as real as this $20 bill is real. I'm dead to sin. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means this. I'm not who I used to be. I don't have to keep living like I used to live. I don't have to continue to give in to those crazy ideas that used to control me. That because of what Jesus did on the cross, I can actually be the person that God wants me to be. Brendan Manning, Brendan Manning was a, a man, a young man that struggled with the passions of his life. And so he decided one day that he was going to become a Catholic priest, and not just a priest, he was going to be a Franciscan monk. I mean, he was going to join the Marines of the priest, okay? He was going to be a monk. He's going to be one of those guys that lived out in the middle of nowhere because, you see, he couldn't control the things inside of him. So he thought, I need a heavy dose of religion. I need to become the ultimate of a religious man in order to finally be free. But here's the sad story. Even as a Franciscan monk and a Catholic priest, he was absolutely controlled and dominated by alcohol. He was a drunk. Brendan Manning was a drunk priest. You see, he thought that if I would become a priest, if I would become religious and I would do all those things, that I would be free. No, he was just a religious drunk with a collar. He said it was then that he realized that there was, there was a sick, he called it a sick, slick, subtle part of him that was nothing but an imposter. It was a fake. That there was this part of him that was faking it all along. He calls it the imposter. And he said, as long as the imposter was living the story of his life, he was trapped and he wasn't free. But then, miraculously, he realized what Jesus did on the cross for him. He realized that it wasn't religion that would save him, but it was faith in Jesus that would save him. And Brendan Manning put his faith and trust in Jesus. And everything changed. He said, you have to stop being fake. You have to stop letting the imposter write the story. You need to be who you are in Christ. So on one side of the $20 bill, you can write, I am dead to sin. On the other side, I am alive to God. I'm alive. I'm not a fake. I'm not going through the motions. This isn't an act. It's real. God has changed my life. You see, the Easter story was supposed to be your story. When Jesus died for you, he wanted to set you free from the things that have been controlling you. He wants you to be able to be who you were meant to be. He wants you to be dead to sin. And he wants you to be alive like you've never been before. That's our hope for you today. That Easter won't be just a story about what Jesus did for you. That Easter will become the story about what Jesus did in you. And how Jesus came to set you free.
Let's bow for prayer together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that Easter is not just history, that Easter is our story, that when you died on the cross, you died to set us free from the things that manipulate and control us. You died so that that imposter would be crucified, that old self that keeps telling us the wrong things to do, that all of that would be our past and not our future. Lord, we realize that to follow you doesn't mean we'll be perfect. It doesn't mean that we'll never stumble and fall. But what it does mean is that we'll never be the same. That we are dead to sin. And that we're alive to you. Lord, if there's someone here that's tired of going through the motions, they realize that religion is never going to meet the needs of their life. It's our prayer that this morning that they would call out to you like Brennan Manning did, that they'll call out to you like, that, like Paul did and like I did and like so many others that were baptized today did, and that they would receive life by faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.